And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and the other at your left, and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Joe, for reading. And I should say also to thank you to the whole congregation. Uh, many of you were here last week uh, for our meeting after the service where I had a chance to put my, my family's weaknesses on, on full display uh, for everyone, uh, which for private people like us is not something we come to easily. Uh, but the kindness and support that we received this past week from you has just been overwhelming. So let me say thank you uh, for letting us say what we needed to say, but also for receiving it the way you did. You may not know this, but Chicago's official English motto is, I will. There's the more official Latin motto, which translates to city in a garden, and I'll let you be the judge if that's accurate or not. Uh, but the other motto is, I will. And that comes from a man named Charles Holloway, who won a contest in 1891, a contest to make a new motto and symbol for the city. It was a few years before the, uh, the World's Fair of 1893, the Columbian Exposition, that put Chicago on the world stage unlike anything ever before. And it wasn't that long after the Great Chicago Fire that destroyed much of the city. So to capture the, sp the spirit of a city rebuilding itself from the ashes and creating this glorious new city uh, as a monument to human progress, I will. But over time, some people said that it had changed from a motto to just a slogan. The Chicago writer Saul Bellow said that the motto had become so devoid of meaning that it raised the question, I will what? The motto of the city, the, the, the culture of the city had, had, had embraced greatness and ambition, but it was greatness without restraint, without purpose, and that I will motto is on full display in this passage. And this desire for greatness, for the sake of greatness, no matter the cost of greatness, turns out not to be just a Chicago thing, but a very human thing. And what Jesus wants you to know is that God's kingdom works according to different standards. That greatness actually looks more like service and slavery. God's idea of greatness isn't our idea of greatness. That's the message for this morning. Let's pray together as we come to hear what God has to say to us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you say that your word is living and active and that it's, it's so sharp that it pierces us into the deepest places of our hearts so that it lays bare our deepest and most hidden thoughts and intentions. And yet, as it exposes, it also comforts and guides. So we pray that your word would do all of these things for us by the power of your Holy Spirit, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So God's idea of greatness isn't our idea of greatness. Uh, what human culture says is great and worthy and valuable, and what the human heart desires to be and honors and values, that's not how God thinks about greatness. It's not how greatness works in God's kingdom. 
you'll notice from the reading, and we'll, we'll, we'll make a, a friendly amendment uh, and, and, and increase our, our, our whole passage here, but there are, are two uh, big sections in the passage. There's what Jesus says about his approaching death and suffering as they're walking towards Jerusalem, starting in verse 32. Then there's this section on greatness, what, what it really means to be great. And the sec- this second section also has, this also has two scenes inside it. There's this, this private conversation between the three J's, Jesus, James, and John. And then there's this, the broader conversation with the, the rest of the disciples. So three smaller segments. And as we consider what God's saying here, we're going to think about it in terms of, of where you're going and what you want to be, where, who you want to be. But also, what God wants you to be, what, where he wants you to be. So three points. Where Jesus is going, where you want to be, and where God wants you to be. So where Jesus is going, where you want to be, and where God wants you to be. So first of all, where Jesus is going. And as it makes absolutely clear, he's going to Jerusalem in order to suffer and die. Let, let's read that starting in verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. So they're on the road, and, and, and they're, they're literally going up to Jerusalem. The, the city is at a higher elevation, so they're, they're walking uphill to Jerusalem. But it says that Jesus is by himself at the front of the pack. So the 12 disciples are there. A bunch of other people are there, apparently. But Jesus is leaving everyone else behind with determination and purpose going up. And that's really unsettling to everyone else. Verse 32 goes on, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. In other words, they've heard what Jesus has said before, he, before about what is going to happen, about going to suffer and die. He's predicted his death twice already. This is the third time. And they know that he hasn't made any friends with the religious and political elite. So it's like he's going straight to the hornet's nest and whacking it with a stick. It, it, you whack the hornet's nest, you're going to get stung. So they're amazed that he's doing this. They're, they're afraid of what's going to happen when it gets there. And Jesus says, what you're afraid is going to happen is going to happen. Look at that starting in verse 32, at the end of verse 32. I'm taking the 12 again. He began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. Twice it says he'll be delivered over. He'll, be, he'll lose his freedom. He'll be put under the power and authority of other people. He'll be delivered over first to the religious rulers of his own people who will judge him and pronounce him guilty. And then he'll be delivered over to the Gentiles, the, the Roman imperialists, and, and they're going to kill him. So think about this irony. Jesus, the, the Jewish Messiah will be rejected by the leaders of his own people and put to death by foreigners. And this is what the foreigners will do, verse 34. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. These four words, mock, spit, flog, and kill, they look forward and backward. Uh, We'll come across them again later in Mark when these things happen, just as Jesus said they would. But they also look backward. In the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, there's a picture of the Messiah who's called God's servant. And all four of those words show up in that part of Isaiah about God's servant, that they'll mock him, they'll spit on him, they'll beat him, and finally, finally they'll kill him. So yes, Jesus will rise again from the dead, but first, he has to suffer and die. That's where Jesus is going. He's walking ahead of the crowd with determination and boldness to lose his freedom and be rejected, be despised, be tortured, and be killed. And the people are amazed. They're afraid. They don't want this to happen. And even for us, because we're we're so far removed from these images and and, and the politics of Mark, or if you've grown up in in, in church culture where where it's just normal that Jesus died, uh, we can miss how shocking this is, how scandalous this is. A show show I watched last year had a a scene of of an interfaith religious dialogue center for, t- for teenagers. It's a, a place for, for people from different religious traditions to get to know each other and to stop demonizing each other. And there are two characters in particular, uh, two teenage girls. One was a Muslim and the other was a Roman Catholic. And the Muslim had deep grievances against uh, about being a religious and ethnic minority in Western culture. 
And the Roman Catholic was a kind of a stereotype, uh, uh, so she couldn't understand people who were different from her. And the Catholic asked the Muslim, in a, a completely tone-deaf kind of way, why do you wear the headscarf? Why are you, why are you giving in to the patriarchal oppression of your religion? To which the Muslim um, responds, points to the cross necklace that the, the Catholic girl is wearing and asks, and why are you wearing a torture device as jewelry? She has a point. I, I don't have any problems with cross necklaces, by the way, but I, I know what you mean by, by wearing them. But to give you a sense of the scandal of the cross and the image of the cross, it would be kind of like wearing the image of an electric chair or a noose or a firing squad as bodily decoration. That There'd be something really off-putting, if not just entirely offensive, if you saw an electric chair necklace, right? And even though Jesus doesn't mention crucifixion explicitly here, this captures a bit of, of the shock and the fear of what these people are feeling as they watch Jesus rushing ahead to his death. But that's where Jesus is going. So that's where Jesus is going. Where are you going? Where do you want to be? Where, where do you want to be? And what does God want you to do? What does God want you to be? Where does he want you? It's one thing to say that this is where Jesus is going, but what Mark's doing is saying that where Jesus is going actually is something to say about your own heart and the way that you view yourself and the way that you view yourself in relation to other people. So where Jesus is going and now where you want to be. And by saying where you want to be, I'm not saying where you wish you want to be, but but where you actually want to be, what, what the human heart in its natural state actually desires, and what human culture props up as, as good and valuable and important. And where you want to be, where the human heart naturally wants to be, is in the position of greatness and power. The examples of this in verses 35 through 40 are the two brothers, James and John. Let's look at that starting in verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. It's kind of a bold, calculating question, isn't it? Uh, they don't go out and say what they really want, but they have the, the gumption to ask Jesus just to give them whatever they happen to want. So Jesus plays along, verse 36, and he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left in your glory. Now, here's what they're envisioning. They're envisioning Jesus going to Jerusalem, and whatever happens with what Jesus just said about suffering and rejection and death and all that, whatever happens, about, whatever happens with all that, then, after that, the important thing is Jesus is going to rule, and he's going to make all their dreams of political freedom and prosperity come true. The imperialists will be driven into the sea, and the, all the Jewish leaders who are collaborating with the Romans, they'll get the axe too. And Jesus will set up heaven on earth, God's kingdom and all of its power and strength here. And in the middle of that kingdom, there's going to be a palace. And in the middle of that palace, there's going to be a throne where Jesus will sit. And on both sides of that throne, two slightly smaller thrones. And James wants to sit in one, and John wants to sit in the other. Of all the things you can say about these two, you can't say that they're, that they're not ambitious. It's harder to get more ambitious than ruling God's kingdom. But it's an ambition that's profoundly prideful and selfish. And yet, this is what the human heart does. This, this is what it wants. This, it wants power. It wants glory. Think about how it feels when you get a less than perfect job performance review. Or when, you, or when someone questions your intelligence or your dedication or your, or your courage. Uh, what, goes, what goes on inside you when that happens? Uh, how, do you, how do you process that when, when someone judges you to be lower or less in some way than how you judge yourself? It's probably this instantaneous, automatic response of self-justification, of the desire to punish the person who's cutting you down, and it's not, something, it's not saying there's something wrong with, with chafing against injustice, especially when that is, it's an injustice against you. Uh, but, but when you're cut down, the reason you respond the way that you do 
is because you have a very strong commitment to your own honor and value. You may not be a, as far along as James and John with this ruling the universe kind of, of, of request, but the same kind of desire is working in your heart too. The desire for greatness and respect and worthiness in the eyes of other people. That's how the human heart works, the Bible says. It's prideful, it's selfish, and it's also exclusionary. This is the only time in Mark where we see James and John doing something on their own. Everywhere else, it's always James and John and Peter. Uh, those three have a particularly close relationship with Jesus, but it's always as a trio, James and John and Peter. But now, not only is their ambition setting them apart from everyone else, but there's one person in particular who's getting noticeably left out, Peter. This trio is now a duet. There are two thrones, not three. But that's what the human heart does. It desires greatness, it desires acclaim, even at the cost of cutting out and running over other people. It's what C.S. Lewis called the inner ring and the desire for the inner ring. In a kind of commence, a commencement address at King's College in London, he said that, that you discover gradually in almost indefinable ways that the inner ring exists and that you are outside it and then later perhaps that you're inside it. It's not easy even at a given moment to say who's inside and who's outside, that people think that they are in it after they have been in fact pushed out of it or before they have been allowed in. And this provides great amusement for those who are really inside. That, that's how the inner ring works, Lewis says. But as unpleasant as the inner ring sounds, it's actually something that everyone desires to be part of. He says that, I believe that in all men's lives at certain periods, and in many men's lives at all periods between infancy and, and, and extreme old age, one of the most dominant elements is the desire to be inside the local ring and the terror of being left outside. And you should know how powerful this desire is, Lewis said, because of all the passions, the passion for the inner ring is most skillful in making a man who is not yet very bad do very bad things. And that's what James and John want. They want to be in the most inner ring in all the universe. That's ambition and pride and elitism and exclusive, exclusivism that's ruthless, even against their closest friends. That's what they want. That's what the human heart wants. And it completely misses out where Jesus is going. So Jesus asks them, do you really get where I'm going? He says in verse 38, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Uh, the cup for that audience was a metaphor for judgment and suffering, and God's wrath. And sometimes we sing the hymn, whatever my God ordains is right. And there's one line that in that song that picks up on this cup metaphor. It says that whatever my God ordains is right though now this cup in drinking may bitter seem to my faint heart, I take it all unshrinking. That's the cup. So Jesus says, if you follow me, I have to drink the bitter cup of suffering. Are you prepared to drink that cup too? He also mentions baptism. Now for us, baptism is a normal part of Christian life and church life. It's, it's lovely, it's beautiful. But for this audience, the word baptism has a more basic meaning. It means to be overwhelmed or swamped, uh, like floodwaters engulfing you, uh, drowning you. At the All Church baptism this past summer down in Promontory Point in Hyde Park, one of our own Northsiders was baptized. And if you were there, you re might remember the size and energy of the waves in Lake Michigan. And I made a losing argument to have the baptisms on the other side of the point, uh, the, the calmer leeward side instead of the, the windward side. Uh, but even though I lost that vote, luckily no one was, was baptized in the more basic sense of the word, of being overwhelmed by the waves, although we got close a few times. But you see what Jesus is saying. He's saying that, are you, are you prepared to follow me in suffering and being overwhelmed and engulfed. Look what they say to that, verse 39. And they said to him, we are able. In other words, sure we can go through all that. We can suffer. We can do whatever it takes. 
as long as we get those two thrones. They're okay with the idea of suffering for Jesus, so they think, as long as they get what they're really after, which is glory. The writer Alan Noble says that the way most people approach faith today actually looks a lot like it does for James and John. So the question for most people in, the, in matters of faith and spirituality is not, is this true or is this good? But the question for most people, Noble says, is will this faith fit within and improve my authentic identity? Or will this faith improve my quality of life? And when that's the way you approach faith, like James and John do, the problem with that is that following Jesus just then becomes a means to an end. A means to satisfy a desire in you that's profoundly self-centered. And think about your own suffering for a moment. Some of you are suffering very, very deeply and bitterly right now. But think about your own suffering. There's one posture which we sang about earlier of it, Be Still My Soul. It's also in the Psalms. It's a posture that says that, that my life is in God's hands, that I don't understand all of his ways, but I know he loves me. And even in my, my, and even in my, my darkest suffering, I can look to God, who is my rock, my fortress, the one whose shadow I dwell under in safety. That's one posture of suffering. But the posture of suffering here is, I've suffered, now what are you going to give me in return? I, I better have earned something out of this. So this is what Jesus says to James and John, people who, are, who, who follow Jesus, even being willing to suffer, but only to get what they really want. Verse 39 again, Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. You're going to suffer for my sake, all right? But to sit on my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those who, for whom it has been prepared. In other words, these positions of power that you're so hungry for, they're not your business. They're not for you to worry about. But that's where you want to be. That's what the human heart really wants. That's what human culture says is good. But God's idea of greatness is not our idea of greatness. So where Jesus is going, where you want to be. One more thing, where God wants you to be. Let's look at that together again, starting in verse 41. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. You can blame them, right? Uh, James and John kind of had this coming to them. But in this moment of resentment and tension, Jesus shows us what God's idea of greatness actually looks like and where he wants us to be in all of this. Verse 42, Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. So those who are considered rulers, or those who are obviously and visibly powerful, the, the great ones, look at those guys. Caesars, generals, governors, the rich and the powerful. What do they do with their greatness? What do they do with their power? They lord it over people, Jesus says. They, they exercise authority over other people. This isn't what some people like to call strong leadership. This is exploitative, self-seeking power. A few months ago, the cover of the Atlantic magazine asked the question, is democracy dying? And the edition traced how all around the world, democracy seems to be declining, or at least stagnating. But autocracy is popping up in its place, all over the place. Autocracy is the, is the rule of one person with absolute power. Uh, that's coming back around, apparently. And it looks more and more like the world of, of Jesus' day, where, where human systems of power, human greatness, are all about lording over other people. Exactly the, the kind of thing that James and John were wanting for themselves. But God's idea of greatness is, doesn't look like that, Jesus says. Verse 43 but it shall not be so among you. Uh, the language here literally is actually, but it is not so among you. Uh, to put that in another way, this isn't how things work in God's kingdom. But if that's the way you're living, with, the, with this human idea of greatness, then you're actually out of sync with God's way of doing things. Here is how, God's, here's how greatness works in God's kingdom. It's the polar opposite of, of human ideas of greatness. Verse 43 again. But it shall not be so, it is, it is not so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. 
A servant is a table waiter, the person who brings you your food and who cleans up after you leave. Not a high position. And a slave is even lower than a servant. For us in our American context, the word slave might be an irredeemably evil word, and rightfully so. Uh, Martin Luther King, on one occasion, was responding to the accusation that he was treating the experience of African Americans as different or even worse than the experience of other, other minorities in America. And King said, yes, it is a different experience. There's only been one group that has been enslaved on American soil. And the pains and the struggles and injustices from slavery, he said, don't just go away. So for us, the word slave grates on us, maybe, and rightfully so. But it would have also have grated on people in Jesus' day. But a slave in that world was someone who had virtually no rights whatsoever. The, uh, the great philosopher Aristotle even said that slaves weren't human beings. Uh, to be a slave is, uh, to, be, to be human is to be free. Uh, slaves aren't free. Therefore, Aristotle says, uh, slaves aren't really human. It's nice how the, the logic works that way. But Jesus says, in God's kingdom, the way things work is that to be great is to be like a waiter. And to be first is to be the subhuman property of all. It's a life not of elitist and of selfish pride, but sacrifice and love. That's God's idea of greatness. No, that's not easy. It, but I hope you also see how, how beautiful this life is too. The theologian Fleming Rutledge says, even in this old world ruled by sin and death, who would want to live a life of utter selfishness? To show any sort of care for others at all, some sort of sacrifice is necessary every day, she says. To be magnanimous instead of vindictive, to stand back and let someone else share the limelight, to absorb the anger of a teenager in order to show, to show firm guidance, to be patient with a parent who has Alzheimer's, to refrain from, undermine, from undermining a colleague, to give away money one would like to spend on luxuries, to give up smoking, to bear with those who can't give up smoking. All such things, large and small, require sacrifice. What would life be like without it, she says. It's actually a beautiful way of living, as hard as this kind of sacrifice is. And Jesus finishes the point saying that this way of making yourself a slave for other people, of being a servant to other people, is actually what Jesus himself does for you. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even Jesus Christ, the royal Son of Man, the only begotten Son of the Father, equal in power and majesty, to whom one day all of creation will bow down, even he didn't come to be served, like those great ones lording it over everyone else. But he came to serve. And the way he came to serve was to die, to give up his life as a ransom for many. When you think of a ransom, uh, don't think um, a payment for kidnapping, uh, like what happens in the movies, uh, but it's actually a payment f to free someone from slavery or captivity. So Jesus served you, in other words, by dying for you, and he died to buy you, to buy you back from slavery. So that means that there are are two kinds of slavery here, doesn't it? There's the slavery as a posture of serving other people rather than seeking your own glory. And it's a slavery and a service that's actually radically free because the only reason you can live that kind of life is that Jesus has bought you out of another kind of slavery, the slavery of sin and death. And that slavery looks free it, it looks like you're living your life the way that you want it to live, like rising up the ladder as high as you want to go. But it's actually a life of captivity where you are at the cruel mercy of your desires and your ambitions and your pride and an entire world that operates the same way. But if you trusted in Jesus, you've been emancipated from that. And now you can do, not perfectly, but sincerely, you can do what you could have never done in your old slavery. You can freely give yourself to other people because that's what Jesus Christ did for you. Being delivered over into the power of other people, being mocked and spat on and flogged and killed to buy you back for the freedom of living in God's kingdom 
as a servant to other people. And that's where God wants you to be. That's greatness in his kingdom. It's where Jesus is going, where you want to be, and where God wants you to be. God's idea of greatness isn't our idea of greatness. So the cold, harsh manager, the gossipy, sour employee, the domineering spouse, the bullying parent, the fair, the fair weather friend, those are the kinds of people whom all of us are inclined to be because our hearts love glory and status and being first. We, we want our thrones. Yet in his mercy, at the infinite cost of his own life, Jesus Christ shows us what true greatness looks like, and he makes it possible for us to actually live like that by buying, out of the, buying us out of the slavery to that old way of greatness. Where God wants you to be isn't where your natural human heart wants to be. It's not where you can be on your own. But God's made a way there. There was Son Jesus. And when you trust him, and his sacrifice for you seeps deeper and deeper down by the power of his Holy Spirit, then that sacrificial spirit starts to work itself out in the details of your own life. And where God wants you to be is where you can be now, which is what he calls greatness. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for Jesus, the, the suffering servant, the Lord of all creation, who made himself a slave for us and died for us, who was executed as a slave to ransom us out of our own slavery, our slavery to sin and death, our slavery to the human system of greatness, our, our slavery to the inner ring, our slavery to our own destructive and exclusionary desires to be first and best of all. You've rescued us from all that. So help us to see the way of your kingdom for spouses who are struggling to serve in their marriages, for, for professionals who struggle to serve their superiors or subordinates or colleagues, for church members who struggle to serve their brothers and sisters in Christ, for all of us, Lord, whose default way of operating is to, to want to sit on thrones of power. Forgive us, Lord, and work the power of the cross deeper and deeper into our hearts so that we can be what you want us to be and what Jesus Christ is for us. And we pray this in his name. Amen.